Don't worry, it's not a bomb. <laughs> it's a muon detector. So over the summer, I had a rare opportunity to work in a physics lab at NTU. I was able to learn a lot about particle astrophysics and was granted resources to build this muon detector, which detects particles that come from space. Okay, so the number on the LED display indicates how many particles have gone through these Geiger tubes. It's only been less than 10 seconds, but you can see that already one muon has been detected. As you can see, these particles are pouring down on us from above, even at this very moment. We've been living under this muon shower for our entire lives, yet we're not even aware of the existence of these particles. Why? Because these whimsical stealthy fugitives are so tiny that they're almost untraceable. They can travel through concrete walls, buildings, and even mountains like they're traveling through air. But in the realm of particle physics, muons are actually one of the easiest to detect. Neutrinos, for instance, are even smaller than muons. They make electrons look like planets, and they're capable of traveling through the entire Earth, <clears throat> barely interacting with matter. So why do they matter? <laughs> One answer would be that these particles may shine light onto the dark, mysterious origin of the vast and elegant universe we are living in. But to most of us, however, that doesn't mean crap. <laughs> We're also too busy with our responsibilities and schedule, we forget to ask ourselves these important questions. But I'm not here today to talk about why these particles, why we should care about the importance of the universe and our cosmic awareness. Neil deGrasse Tyson already does a great job on that. Instead, I am here to talk about why these particles really matter, the infinite possibilities they hold for the future. In 1922, Neil Bohr discovered that atoms are made of electrons. It was one of the greatest discoveries of physics, but people outside the scientific the scientific community didn't really care. But after about 100 years, we now live in a world controlled by electrons. Your phones, this projector, and even this microphone wouldn't have existed without the discovery and our understanding of the electrons. Likewise, we barely know anything about neutrinos at the moment. In fact, it was only this year that a Japanese physicist discovered that neutrinos have mass. However, I believe in the future, we might live in a world controlled by neutrinos. How so? What are some potential applications of these particles? So anyone want to take a guess on who, what kinds of people want to use these particles? Thank you for your response. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first groups of people who tried to use neutrinos were surprisingly bankers. So instead of using conventional internet signal that has to go around the surface of Earth, they wanted to use neutrinos that could travel right through the Earth's core so they could purchase company stocks faster than anyone else. Typical Wall Street, using one of the greatest discoveries of modern physics so they could click faster. <laughs> it's at the time gasoline was first discovered. Before Rockefeller realized the importance, the potential of gasoline as an energy source, the world used petroleum to make clothing. There was too much raw material, they didn't know what to do with it. Maybe it's the same for neutrinos. These particles are pouring down on us from above. At this moment, we just don't know what to do with them. Today, however, I want to talk about one particular possibility that I believe is the most important. Although it's an audacious statement, I believe that in the far, far future, we might live in a world, far, far future, we might use these particles as an energy source. Recently, I see not the rapper, but an observatory, <laughs> observatory that detects particles that come straight out of the South Pole, uh, detected high energy neutrinos that possess 2,600 trillion electron volts. If you convert that to joules, it's actually only 0.0004 joules, which is not even enough to power a light bulb. But we must take the size of these particles into account. As I said before, these particles make electrons look like planets. That means we can fit gazillions of them in a small surface. It's true that there has only been a few instances of these high energy neutrinos, but as detection technology develops, we're um, observing more and more instances of these high energy neutrinos, which means they existed from the beginning, but we just couldn't detect them. Maybe in the far future, a whole new realm of high energy neutrinos might be discovered and if technology develops so much that we are one day able to harness the energies of these particles, we might be granted a non-depleting, almost an infinite energy source. I'd like to discuss one possible implication of such development 
that I believe will change the course of human history. Imagine a vehicle powered by these particles. A vehicle that can not only travel in space without using mass amounts of fuel, but a vehicle that can interconnect the countries on Earth. That is, a revolutionary increase in our physical mobility. Let's first look at the historical patterns. From families to tribes, tribes to cities, and cities to countries, the macro units of society has been expanding since the Stone Age. And every step of this expansion coincided with a revolutionary increase in our physical mobility. Why? It's because the boundaries of the human in-group are ultimately dictated by the level of kinship among its members. This rule applies to all civilizations, regardless of its time and location. Let me quote William Shakespeare. Love breeds hate, and hate breeds love. So what does that mean? In Romeo and Juliet, Capulets and Montagues are two families that absolutely hate each other. Why do Montagues hate Capulets? Because they are Montagues. In a way, this hate is caused by a sense of love. Montagues love their own family, and with their mutual hate against the Capulets, they're able to bond closely together and establish a collective identity. Thus, hate, love breeds hate, and hate breeds love. Though it's an oversimplification, I believe human history can be somewhat simplified to a story of Montagues and Capulets. With hostility and familiarity, society develops in largely three stages. Fragmentation, unification, and expansion. For example, let's look back to the Stone Age. First step, fragmentation. These primitive families are scattered all around in their own caves and fields. But with the domestication of horses and increase in physical mobility, they were able to interact with other families and thus establish a sense of kinship in a larger in-group. So the macro unit of society expanded from families to tribes. Thousands of years later, with the development of steam engines and trains, the macro unit of society once again expanded from cities to countries. In the 19th century, we saw a rise in nationalism, which we couldn't see before because there was a lack of kinship among the members of the countries. But in the 21st century, we see that internet is interconnecting the world even more, and the nascent space exploration attempts show me that we might be near to the rise of planetism. It's easy to think that we are somehow at the final stage of this expansion, that somehow countries are the largest unit of human society, but we are wrong. If we can somehow drastically increase our physical mobility with these particles, the world will be interconnected even further, and resulting in another expansion of society from countries to maybe planets. With these particles, we may be able to fulfill the destiny that we've been carrying with us since the beginning of the human race. To explore. Like Carl Sagan once said, we were born too late to explore the world and more too early to explore the universe. Like a caveman who walked out across the field and Christopher Columbus who set out into the mysterious oceans, we will launch ourselves into the vastness of the universe because human society's expansion is destined to be continued. Thank you.